Hey, okay, welcome to lab number ooh, uh, eight. And uh, this is Archimedes' principle. Uh, let me uh, begin with a little apology uh, because uh, I like to do Archimedes' principle. When I was making the summer schedule, I uh, saw that uh, I go, oh, Archimedes is always a little tricky for the students. Let, let, let's run through a lab. Of course, at the time, I wasn't sure if we were going to be face to face or uh, distance uh, learning. But I put it down on the schedule. And then um, today I realized that Archimedes' principle is not in the 102 lab manual. So uh, I went back to some old files of mine, and uh, this is the Archimedes' principle in an old edition of the uh, 101 lab. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure I attach this to the email that also has the link for this lab and, of course, the lectures for today. So if you click on the, the links, uh, make sure you see the lecture first because the uh, lecture, uh, part one of today, is wrapping up Archimedes and Bernoulli's principle. And so make sure you have a good understanding of Archimedes' principle first, okay? And then uh, come over here and do the lab, although you might as well watch the, the rest of the other lectures and think about the homework and then come do the lab. And then attached to that, um, I will put this piece of paper. So don't dig through your lab manual. There is no Archimedes principle in the, in the uh, lab manual. It'll be this. And so print this. And, and so maybe some good news here is, since this is out of a 101 manual and it's an older one, it's just one page, one sheet. I, I think it does a good job of showing Archimedes principle, but it'll probably then be the shortest lab we'll do this uh, semester here. And so it's just really measuring uh, six times Archimedes principle. And so let me just repeat Archimedes principle. In fact, when you print this up, you'll see that there's not much words on here, but the first part of it really just states what is Archimedes' principle. And it says Archimedes' principle simply states that the buoyant force on an object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. And so if you've already watched the lecture, you heard me say that, we, we kind of worked through how Archimedes reasoned that out. Um, we also then did some equations with it. And so what we're going to do here in the lab is test that. Uh, six times, actually. We are going to take two different samples, a big one and a small one. Uh, it's also different materials. Uh, this is an aluminum and this is a, a zinc. Um, so they're different size. Uh, they're, 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 they're different uh, masses. We're also going to put them in different fluids. Uh, we will start here with regular water. Uh, then we will go on to salt water. Um, and then we will go on to alcohol. And so with two samples and three fluids, we will actually measure Archimedes' principle six times. And hopefully every single time we measure it, we get a verification that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So with that in mind, we then are going to fill in this chart. Uh, let me start with water and let me start with finding the buoyant force. And so what we're going to do is find out what is the buoyant force on sample number one. Let me call this bigger one, the aluminum one, sample number one. All right. And here's how we're going to find the buoyant force. Uh, this is why it was important for you to see that video uh, on the uh, lecture on Archimedes' principle. You might remember that I was saying the buoyant force really was how much the scale reduced down once I put the rock underwater. And we're going to do the same thing. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this scale here. And I am going to then weigh this without being in the fluid, which would be water first. Then it would be salt water. Then it would be alcohol. And then I'm going to weigh it in the fluid. And the difference between that is the buoyant force. And so what we're going to write down here, and uh, maybe I should grab a, a little pen here so that I don't have to go over to the board. We kind of change the angle of the camera here today. Uh, not that it's real hard to go over to the board. We will do that uh, later. But I just want to fill this in. And so let me go ahead and say, okay, what is the reading of sample one and sample two when it is in the air? Okay, so in other words, what is it before I put it under the fluid? All right, so the big one will be sample number one. And so let me hook up sample number one. And so I'm hoping you can kind of see this on the, the video that sample number one is tied to this, this balance. So it's the equivalent of putting it up here on this balance scale. 
And so I'm going to add weights to the other side until I get the balance scale balanced and see how much it, it weighs. All right. Now I'm not going to actually put weights over here. This model comes with some sliding weights. And so this is the equivalent of putting them on here. So not using these top surfaces, I'm using here and off to the side. And that's 60, so it must be more than 60. And I think it's less than 70. Yeah, see, see how 70 just kind of pushes it uh, over. So let me come back here to the 60. 70 is, is too much. So I know it's 60 and a little more. And that little more is why this other little weight is here. And so like if I put it right there, that's 67, and obviously that's not enough yet. So it's, it's more than 67. There's 68. There, ooh, 69. It's starting to move. Okay. And so it looks like it's a little more than that. And, oh, too much. Maybe I'll get something. I can just give it a little touch. So 69, 3, 1, 2, that'd be 69, 3, that looks like it's pretty good. There's 69, 2, oh, that looks a little better. All right, so I'm going to call that 69, 2. And so, assuming you've already printed this, write down how much does sample number 1 weigh, 69.2. And we'll just do everything in grams, so I won't write the grams, I'll just know. So there it is, sample number one, what does it weigh? It's 69.2. Now eventually I'm going to put it under water, but I might as well get ready for what I'm going to do when I put it under salt water and alcohol. See, the reading on the scale in the air would be the same thing. So I might as well copy the 62.9 and the, six, I'm sorry, 69.2 all the way down here. And so that's a, our first bit of data here is how much does sample number one weigh in the air? Okay, so now that I got sample number one, let me try the same thing with sample number two. And like I said, sample number two is deliberately a different material and a different size. So you can see that it works. Archimedes' principle works. Notice that Archimedes' principle is a general principle. It's not just saying it only works this way if it's a metal or if it only is aluminum. It's saying for anything, anything underwater, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. I mean, under any fluid. So we can see that it's going to work for all these fluids. It's going to work for all these samples. Now, let me just move that one back here and see what I have. Now, ah, and it looks like 60 is not enough and 70 is too much. Okay, so this too is somewhere in the in the 60s. Uh, kind of felt like it's going to be a little bit lower than the other one. Yeah, and so it looks like it's beginning to kind of change here at about a 66. Uh, oh, and that looks good actually. And that's a, I'll call that a 65.9. All right, so I'm going to write down 65.9. Okay, let me just double check. Yeah, that's a five. Okay, so, so there it is. What is number two, sample number two? 65.9. And again, I might as well put that for the other fluids that I'm about to dunk it under. All right, so, th so there's the first column. And like I said, our goal here then is to figure out what is the buoyant force. Because to test Archimedes' principle, we're trying to find what is the buoyant force, so this gray box, and see how it compares to the weight of the displaced fluid. And, and hopefully they're pretty close. That's really what we want to, to verify. Okay, so now let's put it under a fluid. All right. So I'll come back over here. I might as well go in order. So let me disconnect number two and reconnect number one. Um, maybe I'll just put the lighter one at zero and say, okay, now what would it read if it was submerged under a fluid? So starting with just fresh water. Come over here. and submerge it in this fresh water. 
Uh, let me go ahead and make sure that it is not hitting the bottom or the sides. Okay. Looking good. Okay, I like that. Now, what is the reading? And, of course, you can see the 60 is a little too much, so I'll go back to 50. Oh, wow. Okay. I'll go back to 40. And so it looks like it's somewhere in the, in the 40s. Uh, let me go 40. And it looks like it's starting to get balanced at about 45-ish. I'll call that good. So that looks like 45.1234. So 45.4. So 45.4. So that's how much it weighs in the fluid. Now, let me not do the math. I'm going to leave this for you. But if you subtract these two, this is the buoyant force. Remember, we, we said the reading on the scale is how much this is pulling up. And the reason it reads less is because the water is compared to what it was reading before. And so the difference between what it read before and what it's reading now is the buoyant force. So you need to subtract these two in order to find out that buoyant force. So, so I'll let you do that. But meanwhile, I'll go ahead and say, okay, what then is the buoyant force when sample number two is submerged underwater? And just remembering what I learned in class, I know that the buoyant force, this is what we're trying to confirm, is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Uh, I, I, being a smaller object, it should be displacing less fluid. And so I would think that the, the buoyant force uh, for sample number two would be, would, would, would be less. But let, let's just see what, what happens here. Okay, so let me zero this one back. Oh, maybe I should take a good look at it. Am I touching the top, the bottom, the sides? Nope. Okay, so it's just floating around in the water. So the only thing lifting on it is the, is the water. And it looks like 40 is not enough and 50 is not enough and 60 is too much. So the reading on this scale now is going to be somewhere in the, in the 50s. So it is going to be a decrease, but not as much as the bigger one. That makes sense, right? I'm not displacing as much fluid. I got a smaller object. And so it looks like somewhere around 56, one. And maybe that's a little too far. Come back one right there. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so it looks like 56.6. All right, so I'm gonna write that down. 56.6. Okay, and I'll hold this up here. And so again, you wanna find the buoyant force on this when it's under the water. And so again, subtract the two. And so subtract these two and put that number right here in the gray box. And so that'll give you the buoyant force. And of course they are different. And again, hopefully you'll notice right away. I'm not gonna do the math, I'm gonna let you do it. But hopefully you'll see that the buoyant force on the bigger one, sample number one, is, is more than number two. Because again, we're trying to show Archimedes principle is true. We're trying to show that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Which, by the way, that's what this other part is. Now get the weight of the displaced fluid. But I'll hold off on that because as long as we're measuring things up here, let's go ahead and do the salt water here. Uh, let's uh, submerge our objects into our salt water and find out what the buoyant force is on the salt water objects. Okay, so I'm going to pull number two out and move the water out of the way. And since number two is already hooked up, Maybe I will just continue to work with number two. And dunk number two in the salt water container. 
And if you were, you know, in class here, face to face, you know, I'd tell you to look at the bottom of this container and you'll just see tons and tons of salt because all we do is put water and we put salt down at the bottom and we stirred it and there's just, it's just loaded with salt, as much salt as we, we, we can get. And, uh, you know, the salt only dissolves so much. Uh, so we got lots and lots of salt water in there. And so now let's take a reading of, of number two. And of course, just kind of thinking about this, I know that it's displacing the same volume that it did when it was in the fresh water, but the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. And if salt water has a greater density, I would think that the buoyant force would be a little bit greater here on sample number two than it was on sample number two when it was in the, in the, in the fresh water. But again, let me not just even worry about that. Let's just take a, a, a measurement here. And so you can see that I have to reduce this more, which again is telling me, that, hey, this buoyant force, now that it's in salt water, is more than it was when it's in fresh water. Because again, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. And in terms of volume, I'm displacing the same amount because it's submerged, whether I'm in the salt water or the fresh water. But now, with the salt water being of higher density, it should be a little bit more. Of course, it depends on the density. And I, I wish we had even a higher density. Maybe we should get a mixture of a bunch of different salts because, you know, uh, we could make it even a greater uh, density than that. But this is what we have to work with today, so we'll, we'll go with it. But it looks like that would be 54.1234567. So 54.6, 54.6. And again, I'll, I'll hold this up so you can see it, but uh, again, sample number two, uh, again, how the reading, 54.6. So subtract those two and you'll get the buoyant force. And you'll see that that number is bigger than when you subtracted those two. And so, yeah, we are getting a bigger buoyant force on uh, number two, because again, the density of the salt water is, is greater. And yet, we're displacing the same volume. That's important because it's not just the density of the of fluid, it's the density and the volume. And so, same volume, but greater uh, density. All right, well, with that being uh, said here, why don't I pull number two sample up and replace it with sample number one. And put sample number one in the salt water and let me just get around behind it make sure it's not touching the sides and the top or the bottom so that looks really good and again hopefully kind of the same logic comes into play that being in the salt water hopefully I will get a bigger buoyant force than this sample number was number one was when it was in the the fresh water and I think that's true. Let me uh, move this back to 40. And in fact, it almost is leveling right there at an even 40. I think it's going to be just a hair more than 40. So it's not even a 41. Looks like it's a 40.12. So 40.2. And again, I'll, I'll hold this up. So, so right here, 40.2. This is the, the reading on the scale when the sample number one is in the salt water. And again, if I compare it back to sample number one in fresh water, of course, subtract the difference to get the buoyant force. And again, let me not do that. But when you do it, you will hopefully see that this buoyant force for the salt water for number one is bigger than it was for fresh water. So this is, again, showing you hopefully very clearly, or at least getting towards that we're going to do some closer numbers here. But it's beginning to show Archimedes' principle is true. It is showing that I get a larger buoyant force in the salt water than the fresh water for the same displaced volume. That, that, that's important. Same displaced volume, but greater density in the, in the salt water. Because you put something of a smaller volume in the higher density, it, it may actually have less of a buoyant force than the fresh water. So it, it, it's important I keep saying for the same volume. And these are the same objects, so they are the same volume. All right, well, let's see if we can see the same thing with the alcohol. I, I, I know from experience, and I'm going to tell you that the density of the alcohol is, is less than the fresh water. Therefore, I would expect the buoyant force 
to be less for the same volume, okay? And so let's try the third and final fluid here. And so grabbing the sample number one out of the salt water and moving it out of the way. And we're done with the fresh water, but I am going to just kind of dunk the sample in to kind of clear off the salt a little bit and kind of put it down here on the table. I can clean it up. So that way I can keep my isopropyl alcohol somewhat clean and that evaporates. So I'd like to leave a rubber stopper on there. And so now let's see what the buoyant force is when I submerge sample number one. And let me just again double check that it's not touching the top or the bottom. Good. It's not touching left or right or forward, back. Good. And let's see what the buoyant force is. Um, it looks like 40 is not enough. Oh, and 50 it might actually be 50. Let's see. Not quite. Oh, and this wasn't all the way at zero, but it's still not there. That's, I forgot to reset that one, but it's still not there. So let me just do a little bit more. One more. Whoops, that's two. Maybe that's too much. Go back. I'm going to call it there. So it's 50, not even 51. It's 50 point. One, two, three, four, five. So 50.5. So sample number one, reading on the scale when it's in the fluid. And so there it is, the alcohol fluid. Sample number one, reading on the scale 50.5. So again, this is your math. Take the difference between them and that's going to be that buoyant force. And again, hopefully you'll see the buoyant force and the buoyant force we got in the water, which we already said. The buoyant force in the water was less than what we got in the salt water. And so what we're going to see here is, yeah, it is related to the weight of the displaced fluid. All of these have the same volume, but they have different densities. And so the smallest density then would, for the same volume, have the smallest weight of displaced fluid. So it should have the smallest buoyant force. And that's what we're beginning to see already here. So alcohol is the smallest, salt water is the biggest, regular fresh water is in the middle. Okay, and then finally, sample number two. And so I'll pull this out. Take sample number two. Maybe clean off a little bit there of the salt. Drop it into the alcohol fluid, the isopropyl alcohol. And then I see some salt coming off. I should have rinsed that better. Dang. All right. So left and right. Forward, back, top, bottom. Not touching anything. Yeah, it's leaching a lot of salt. Um, then what is my reading? And so let me uh, reset this all the way back just to check. Okay, so it's got to be more than, than 50. I'll keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Does it go all the way to 60? Oh, I should have tried 60. Oh, okay. We're going to get there. But uh, I had got, I'll just go back to the water. Let's see, the reading on the scale in the water was 56. So this should be a lower buoyant force. So I should get more than 56. Yeah, okay. And I, and I am. Okay. And so maybe right there is a balance. So that's 58, one, two, three, four, five, six. So 58.6. So 58.6 then would be the reading on the scale for sample number two when it's submerged in the alcohol. All right, so I'll say it again, your job then 
when the video is done here is to subtract these two and find out the Boyne force. And hopefully you'll see if, again, sample number two, just like sample number one, the lowest buoyancy force will be under in the alcohol and the biggest one will be in the salt water because again, Archimedes principle says that the buoyant force should be equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. So if you can imagine sample one or sample two made out of that fluid, whether it be water, salt water, or alcohol, how much would it weigh? And it would be a combination of its volume and its uh, density of that, that fluid. And so the one with the most density, because they always are going to have the same volume, would be the one with the greatest weight, which is the greatest buoyant force. So sure enough, we see that with the salt water. And the lowest one would be the alcohol. And so, so we're seeing that. So, so far things look really good. Now let's go to the other half of the tables. The other half of the tables are, go. okay, let's go ahead and get the weight of the displaced fluid. All right, well, to do that, this is where I'm going to come over to the board. Uh, I'm going to do some calculations as well as some measurements. But uh, as you saw in the lecture, uh, if I go to calculate weight, weight is always mg. Now, of course, when we talk about the weight, the mass we must use is whatever object we're, we're, we're talking about. So if I'm talking about the mass or the weight of the displaced fluid, I'm going to put a little f here, like I did in the lecture, for the fluid. Uh, that means this would be the density of the fluid times the, uh, let me, well, bummer, I just want to correct something here, uh, times the volume of it, and that would actually be the weight. And although I said weight, and that's how Archimedes' principle is presented, the force is equal then to the weight of the displaced fluid. I just realized as I started to write out this equation that what we actually measured was mass. We didn't multiply it by the g. So to compare it, I, I need to drop the g. Drop the, the G, uh, and then of course this case would be dividing by G, and then this would be the mass of the displaced fluid. And so I should have said this. I should have said, let's find the mass of the displaced fluid. That would be the density of the fluid times the <coughs> volume of the fluid. Uh, that's why if you're looking at your data sheet, you will see that the first two white columns are right here. The first one says, what is the volume of their sample? So let's find that first. Uh, then it says, what's the density of your fluid? And if you multiply those two together, you're going to get the mass. And that's the part I'm going to have you do. So let me work with you as your partner. Let me, let me measure each of these two with you. Then your job will be to multiply those to find the mass. And then hopefully to confirm Archimedes' principle, the mass of the displaced fluid really, and so that's weight, that's really mass, should be equal to the buoyant force or the mass of the object. And so these are really masses. So they just drop the G in both calculations. And I, I get that. So I. Uh, Apologize for, for not seeing that at first and kind of going through there. So let's start with the volume. Let me look at sample number one. Uh, sample number one, as you know, is a cylinder, I should say, number one and number two. And both of them are being a cylinder. And you get the volume of a cylinder by taking the area of the base, so that would be pi r squared, times the height. So let me figure out what is R and what is H for each of our samples. And I'll start with number one. So coming over here and uh, maybe also finding my calculator here, getting it ready. Uh, let me get those two measurements. And so I'll dry off sample number one. Uh, let me use these fancy calipers. I'll even come over here to the board. But um, it's just this jaw that opens up and closes. And you saw this when we did the rotation. 
So this says the diameter is 19.8 millimeters. Uh, let me put that into my calculator, 19.08 millimeters. I would prefer centimeters. Uh, you'll see that in just a second because we're going to measure density in centimeters. So let me divide that by 10. And then let me divide that by 2 because remember this was really the diameter. So I want the, the radius. And so this is then saying that the radius is 0.954 centimeters. All right. Uh, let me also uh, get the length of this cylinder. And this is a long one, but I think it'll fit in here. Yeah. And I guess I'm upside down here, but there it is, 83.19. So again, if I go 83.19 and divide by 10, oh, and I don't have to cut this one in half. This is actually the height. Okay. So this would be 8.319 centimeters. So to get the volume, uh, let me take the pi times 0.9 five four squared times eight point three one nine and I get a volume of twenty three point seven nine cubic centimeters so coming over to my data sheets I am going to write down here volume of sample number one what I say twenty three so 23.79 and I might as well do that all the way for each of the three liquids because the volume of my sample isn't going to change. It's uh, number one as I said was made out of aluminum and that's going to be its, its volume. All right, now let's do the same thing with number two. All right, and so number two is still sitting in the alcohol here. So let me dry off the alcohol. And let me just close this all the way up and reset. Sometimes it gets off. It looks like it didn't uh, that time. Uh, let me do the same thing. Um, I'll shoot for the diameter, but it's the same as the other ones. They kind of came off the same stock. I think the other one we say 19.08 and this is, depending on how hard I push, the, the same number. So I'm not even going to mess with uh, doing the calculation. I'll just say it's the, the same radius as the other one. Uh, but it clearly is a different height. And so the height, much smaller. Looks like it's a 32.40. Okay. So 32.40 and then divide by 10 makes 3.2 centimeters. So the volume of number two then would be, and I'll just go through it again, pi times 0.954 squared times 3.240 uh, gives me a volume of 9.26 cubic centimeters. Okay. So I'll put that on my data table here. All right. So 9.2, I said 6, right? 6. And 9.26 and 9.26. And I'll hold it up in case you couldn't see it there in the camera. But so there's the volume of each of them. Okay. So now if I just get the density of the water and the salt water and the alcohol, I can then multiply that together and then find out what is the mass of the 
displaced fluid. And then see if it matches the buoyant force. And hopefully it will all six times. Trying to show you it doesn't matter what fluid, it doesn't matter what material it is, it doesn't matter how big the materials are. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. All right, so let's get the densities. And the first one, water, is really easy. It's the standard one gram per cubic centimeter. I'm not even going to measure it. I'll just put, okay, here's one gram per cubic centimeter. Uh, maybe I'll write it on the board here. So for the water, the fresh water, it is one gram per cubic centimeter. Now you can see why I wanted the volume in cubic centimeters because by taking the volume in cubic centimeters and multiplying it by the density in grams per cubic centimeters, you're going to get grams. In fact, I can do these just in my head, obviously, because 23.79 times 1 is 23.79 grams. So I would say the buoyant force is about 24. And so looking at this, if I add 24, yep, it would match. But meh, let me not get out my calculator. It, it, it's going to match. Good. Now, let's look at the other ones. Uh, I'll need the density of the salt water. Now, for that, it depends how much salt dissolves. So that's why I was kind of waiting for the uh, lab here to go ahead and see what this density is. And this is kind of nice because this actually uses Archimedes' principle to measure the density. You see, this is just a little object with a lot of weight of lead at the bottom, and it'll drop it into the liquid, and it will float at some point. And if the liquid is really dense, then it's going to float high. Remember that calculation we did in class, the percentage underwater. If the density of this fluid is low, it will go down deeper. And that's what our number's in. So if it goes all the way down to here, the density would be 1. If it floats here, it'd be 1.1. If it floats here, it'd be 1.2. And so these are called hydrometers. And I can then just read the side of this to see what it's floating at. And it looks like, come back here, 0.2. 